mentioned, I've had a, a bit of an odd career. When I was 23, I became fascinated by aging and older people. And over the last 43 years, I have dive, attempted to dive deeper and deeper and deeper into trying to figure out what happens when more and more of us live longer lives. And what happens when this quirky baby boom generation grows older. And a, a nutty thing happened along the way, which is that I passed my 65th birthday myself, which really got interesting. I, a few months ago, I was, got at one of these notes in the mail. Uh, Dear Ken Dykewall, now that you're a senior, and I'm going to get to that word in a few minutes, we'd like for you to consider joining the Trident Society. And I thought, well, I'm a scuba diver. This must be some kind of a cool worldwide you know, journey thing. And I opened it up, and it was a burial at sea program. <laughs> and um, so I get to talk a little from my own experience, too. What we're going to do today is we're going to take a look in these few minutes we have at how the boomers are going to transform aging and also how aging will transform them. What I ask you to do is to take all the things you currently think about this subject and park them. Because I'm going to come at this perhaps a little bit differently than you might in your normal day to day. And I'm going to throw a few curveballs in along the way. First, let me ask, though, before I get started, how many of you would like to live to be 100? No matter what? Yeah. So right in there is an interesting issue. And hold on to that one, because what you're going to see in the next few minutes is that biology, psychology, demography, and sociology all mix up in some interesting ways. And if you're thinking about building the housing opportunities or community opportunities of the future, or if you're thinking of investing, you need to understand the whole dance. First, let's build on the facts. We know that during the Depression, the birth rate hit an all-time low in the 1930s in America. And then during the war, it dropped even further. And then the boys came home, and 92% of all women who could have kids did. And they averaged just under four kids each. And this massive baby boom was formed. Now, if you take a look with me at this chart, you see the 1950s. And this is a demographic portrait of each of the age segments and how they either grew or shrank during that decade. And what we see is that people often think that the future is about technology or future is about economics. What I'd have you consider is that the future is about demography as well, and it's about us. So during that decade would have been a great time to be in the kid-focused business. But look what happened in the 1960s and the 1970s and the 1980s. The 1990s would have been a great time to have been president of the United States. And I've had this discussion with President Clinton, first President Clinton. Um, because the number of 18 to 34-year-old Americans shrank by 9 million people during that decade. So you could have taken credit for all the low unemployment rates. Boomers were entering in their peak tax-paying years. So you could have taken credit for the huge tax surplus. And the elder generation, having been born during the Depression, were very small, so you could lavish enormous entitlements on them without breaking the bank. All right, but that decade is long over. Here's the decade we're just coming out of. And now I'm going to ask you to take a deep breath, especially those of you who are investors. And I'm going to show you how America is reconfiguring between 2010 and 2030. And I could show you slides like this for countries all over the world. It's almost identical. There is no market force more predictable than the age wave. Your industry is going to have the wind in its sails. If you went to sleep tonight and had a dream about the most extraordinary demographic opportunity that could be facing this industry, this is it. However, future behavior is not as easy to predict as demography. Who are the boomers going to be when they get older? Because if you get that wrong, you're out. In fact, I think there's two major ways that many of you will fail. First of all, if you say, we are expert on older adults, there's just going to be twice as many of them, you'll fail. Or other people say, I'm tuned into boomers, I understand the boomer mindset, we're just going to picture them with wrinkles, you'll fail. You will win if you can imagine this generation, understand what's in their hearts and souls and minds and bodies, and then project them into a stage of life that itself is morphing as they migrate into it. I'm going to show you how I might do that. 
I'm going to take a look at four ways here today and just hit them gently. First, there's been a lot of talk lately about income inequality. The idea that some people have it, other people don't. You just watch what happens in the years to come when people come to terms with longevity inequality. Because wellness, a lifetime of wellness, is about to become the prize for a generation that's going to be having aches and pains and all sorts of physical challenges. And you're going to see in the years to come that there'll be more and more breakthroughs, some of which will be enormously expensive and only accessible to very wealthy people that will allow people to sustain their youth or to grow old young or to not age. Craig Ventner, who decoded DNA, he and my friend Peter Diamandis have now got a company, Longevity Inc., where they're attempting to break the code of aging. Google's Calico is attempting to stop aging. There are already over 100,000 wealthy Americans that are injecting each day with anti-aging hormones. Peter Duell from PayPal talks about buying young people's blood to transfuse so that his body can regenerate. Scientists now tell us that due to exponential breakthroughs that are coming, you're going to see today's young people living to 150 or more. The boomer generations will be at the front end of that revolution, and some will get access and others will not. And that's going to be interesting. Second, retirement, if you look it up in Webster's Unabridged Dictionary, it says to disappear, not making that up, to go away, to withdraw. That somewhere in the middle of the 20th century, this notion was conjured up that a wonderful thing to do when you reached a certain birthday was to stop working, kind of move off the playing field, and relax. Now, I think that halting work or taking a break from work or relaxing more is probably a great thing. But today, we've got about 70 million retirees. And last year, the average retiree watched 49 hours of television a week. And so one of the questions that boomers are asking as they watch their moms and dads and big brothers and sisters is, that seems pretty boring. You know, I don't know if I want to be isolated. I don't know if I want to live in a retirement village. I don't know if I want to be completely disconnected from young people. I don't know if I want to stop working permanently. And by the way, you should know that the highest rate of entrepreneurial success in the last 20 years in America has been people over the age of 50. And 77% of boomers say they want to work in retirement, but not full time. And more than half of them want to try something different that they've never done before. Now, as you can imagine, if this is stirring up, the notion that retirement may not be the first choice as we know it. Add to that the fact that about a third of the boomers are doing pretty well financially. About a third are in the middle, and they'll be able to make it through their later years with some cutbacks and some careful planning or communal living or sharing society or groups of people living in a home together. But about a third of the boomers have got less than $1,000 net savings. They're going to struggle in their retirement. They won't be able to afford to retire. Because, in fact, the demographic quirk that gave us today's modern retirement was that small generation that gave birth to a large generation and then well-educated them, which allowed them to have this retirement, added to the fact that their frugality served them well. Boomers are a different cut of the cloth. If we can come back to my slides for a second. Now, here I'm going to really upset a few of you, and I apologize. I don't think the word seniors is going to make it. And I know that a lot of your companies have got the word senior in your brand. Every study that's ever been done in the last 10 years of boomers says that they don't ever want to be seniors. They might like to be elders. They might like to be older adults. They might to be long-lived people. Airbnb is now launching a thing focused on what they call modern elders. The name is questionable, but seniors is not going to make it. So if you're building your communities and your marketing and your intelligence based on the 20th century notion that people really want to stop work, separate from society, not do much of anything other than relax and socialize, and be called seniors, you're going to fail. 
I don't want you to fail. Take a look at this for a second. Historically, we've lived what I'll call a linear life plan. Life was short, biologic clocks were ticking away, you learned, you worked and raised your family, you had some leisure, then you passed away. I have some pictures. You learned and it was believed that you would learn one time. You fell in love and it was the notion that it would last till the last breath you took. You divided up the responsibilities, honey, I'll do this, you'll do that. The kids were supposed to turn out perfect, and then right before you died, you took a cruise, and that was the package. <laughs> but here's a mental exercise. If I had the gift of longevity to give out, I don't. But if I could give you three more years, if I could give you 10 more years, if I could give you 30 more years, and you had to decide what you were going to do with that longevity, where you were going to put it, you wouldn't put it at the end. And that's perhaps the biggest mistake that people make when they contemplate gerontology. They think that increasing longevity gives a longevity bonus, and that people are gonna stick that at the end of their lives, so that people are gonna live their lives in the exact same way folks always have, they'll just be old longer. That's not what you would do. My guess is what you would do is you would distribute them. You'd go back to school at 40. You'd retire, then maybe start a new career. So is that retirement? You might fall in love again if you were divorced or widowed. You might start a new company. You might write your first book of poems when you're 80. Or if you're John Glenn, you might decide you're going to go up into space at 77. And what Glenn said to the media the day he made his announcement was, just because I'll be 77 doesn't mean I still don't have dreams. And we think that only kids have hopes and dreams. And our communities are designed to be places where people are nostalgic for who they used to be. In the future, people will have new dreams at 60 and 80 and 100. This becomes the model of a long-lived society. Flex retirement, have you seen it? In the entertainment industry. <laughs> you know, Stevie Wonder plays for a while, he takes a break for a year or two. Patti LaBelle comes back and forth. Rolling Stones sell out all their tours, and they're older than our Supreme Court currently. <laughs> Third, how many of you remember what this is a picture of? Right, air raid drills. The idea was if a thermonuclear bomb goes off in your building, if you put your head under your desk, you'll be fine. <laughs> and we practiced. Unfortunately, this is the strategy that many boomers have adopted pertaining to their long lives and their late life financial and housing planning. They stick their heads under their desks and they hope that everything works out fine. Most people haven't thought much about what they want to do at 70 or 90. Very few people have contemplated where they want to live, who they want to live with. They haven't come to visit your offerings. It's amazing to me how few people know what it is you offer because they've never looked at it. Not only will this generation have very little financial or family security, but they'll be blamed for everything. Here is a cover from Philadelphia Magazine a short while ago. <laughs> Dear Boomers, just die already. This is a generation that people love to hate. So will there be an enormous amount of generosity going towards them? Probably not. They will have to fend for themselves. They'll have to find communities and homes and neighborhoods that they can afford. They'll be making new friends. They'll be reinventing themselves. And you can either help or not pay attention. Which takes me to my last point. I think the idea that living a long life should be simply an extension of youth or that you should simply fulfill on the dreams of your childhood is going to be replaced by the idea that maybe I can give back. Maybe there's a new purpose to my life. Maybe I could be somebody I've always dreamed of being. Maybe I can learn to play the piano or paint or sculpt or help kids in need or volunteer at the boys club or go back to school. Boomers are a purposeful generation. They want to be somebody. They want their lives to have meaning. And in their later years, when they have time affluence, they will have an enormous appetite 
to give back. Let me show you before I wind up here one example. It's not a perfect example, but it's an example of one community with a very old generation living there attempting to link them up with young kids in another country. Hello, hello. Melissa. Hi, Dick. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? How are you today? I'm good. How are you? It's, it's the I, first uh, time that I'm talking with someone from another, another country. I'm very excited to be doing this. I look like I'm only 25, but, uh, but I'm, I'm 88. <laughs> I'm live with my old brother. He has 23 years. Do you know, instead of saying he has 23 years, you could say he is 23 years old. I tried to go to Lollapalooza that we have next week, I think, in Brazil, but my mom didn't let me. Uh, you got a good mom. <laughs> good morning, dear Julia. Good morning to you. This is your dad? That's me and my wife when we were young. Oh, you were good looking when you were young. And you're still good looking. <laughs> if you could just dream and have whatever you want, what, would you, what do you think you would like to be doing? I see myself in a big family, you know, with a beautiful wife. You know. I want to thank you for this change of experience, you know. You are incredible. Abracado. You are my new granddaughter, and I love you. I love you too. And if you were here, I would give you a big hug. <laughs> oh, yeah, let's hug. Oh. Bye. There's an age wave coming, which is the most extraordinary demographic disruption in history, and it benefits you. There will be an enormous pursuit of longevity and lifelong health and wellness. It'll go beyond anything you can imagine. Our notions of retirement are obsolete, and calling people seniors may be obsolete as well. People will have to find communities and homes and neighborhoods that can help them live the lives they want to live because there will be far less family and financial security for this demographic wave. And people are going to search for ways to be connected, relevant, involved, live with purpose, give back. Thank you for allowing me to be with you this morning. Hopefully I've given you a few things to think about. Have a fantastic conference here at Nick. Thank you so much.